Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Sandy Quinn, and I'm president of the Richard Nixon Foundation. And it's my pleasure, my honor, uh, to welcome you to this 12th anniversary of the tragedy of 9-11. We observe this every year. The first year, we had 21 tons of steel from the World Towers, and we had a fire truck that was there for a month uh, and then retired because of its condition. And we displayed it in the parking lot and we had thousands of people for two weeks, day and night, coming, touching, leaving flowers, leaving messages, bringing their children, praying. Um, then we brought it back uh, on the 10th anniversary. Every year we have been honored with senior officials from the military and we have that today, and other very distinguished speakers, and we have that today too. We have a good program for you. And before we do the presentation of the colors, I want to introduce the person who's going to lead the pledge. Uh, I woke up this morning and saw President Obama speaking from the Pentagon. The President chose the Pentagon for his observance of 9-11. And on that day, the terrorists chose to attack frontally uh, our military headquarters, the Pentagon. There was a army ranger, a general's aide, in the building at that time. When, when the building was hit, he was thrown. He was injured to the point where he received the Purple Heart later. He is a hero because he spent 60 hours uh, nonstop, as he says, on pure adrenaline and the American spirit rescuing at the Pentagon. When he rushed out there, there was a lady with her baby. He grabbed the baby and got them to safety. So giving our pledge today, an Orange County resident, a Purple Heart winner, an American hero in my book, and I hope yours, uh, Sergeant First Class Chris Brayman. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please stand. Please stand for the presentation of the colors by the Orange County Fire Authority Honor Guard, followed by the pledge. Repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. And please thank the Fire Authority Color Guard. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now let me introduce a few people starting with a couple of members of our board. 
uh, Marie Nunn. Where is Marie? Marie, uh, Marie Nunn right here. Thank you, Maureen. And a board member emeritus who joined his father in encouraging Richard Nixon to run for Congress back in 1946, Hubert Perry, who is... <laughs> Hubert is 100 years old this year. Thank you, Hubert. Hubert has to leave early. His bowling league is meeting. <laughs> I'd like to introduce the mayor pro tem of our home city, Yorba Linda, Craig Young. <laughs> council members, council members, Mark Schwing, Mark, Jean Hernandez. And representing Congressman Ed Royce, Chairman of America's uh, Congressional uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, his Deputy Chief of Staff, Kara Cadillac. <clears throat> <Catalan. clears throat> representing our good friend, the Sheriff, is uh, Sheriff Don Barnes. Sheriff Barnes. And our good friend, the former chairman of the Republican Party of Orange County, Lois Lundberg. Where is Lois? <laughs> Lois Lundberg. <laughs> now, Lois, Hubert at 100 stood. Uh, no, I, I know. No, I know. I know. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, for the invocation, I am pleased to introduce the Adult Ministries Pastor at Friends Church, Pastor Kent Cranning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come here this morning to remember the scriptures tell us that on the night when you were betrayed, you offered bread and wine as symbols of the sacrifice that you would make. They were to help us remember because we are so prone to forget. Father, your son made the ultimate sacrifice for us so that we might live. He said, greater love is no one than this, than he laid down his life for his friends. This morning we remember where we were when those events so tragically unfolded that morning. We remember the thousands whose lives were lost. We remember those who were killed by our enemies and those who sacrificed their lives so that others might live. Father, we also remember this morning those who lost loved ones that day. For many of us, the days have gone back to normal, but for the mothers whose sons did not come home that day, for the wives, who are widows and the children left fatherless, for the family members who continue to have an empty seat at the table, these days never returned to normal. Their loss is remembered more vividly than for the rest of us, Lord, and so we pray a special prayer for them. Father, we claim Psalm 18, 2 for them this morning in which David declares, the Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. We pray Psalm 68, 5, that you might be a father to the fatherless and a protector of the widows. Father, be with us this morning as we choose to remember, as we choose to not forget those who were taken, those who were left behind, and those who willingly ran into danger for the sake of others they did not even know. Thank you for their lives and for their sacrifice. May we honor their memory here in this place. May your spirit guide our time together. May all those personally touched by this tragedy feel a very real touch of your Holy Spirit. And may our remembrances today throughout this great nation be a tribute to those who are gone and an encouragement to those left behind that we have not forgotten. Lord, bless and keep them. Lord, make your face to shine upon them and be gracious to them and turn your face toward them and grant them peace today. 
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Chuck Jay. Chuck Jay and the and the great uh, the great ensemble from Villa Park High School. Thank you, Chuck. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we've always been very privileged to have a senior uh, official from um, Camp Pendleton, and today we've got one tough dude. Uh, he served in Iraq. He served in Afghanistan. He served in the Gulf War. He was commanding general of Camp Pendleton. And most recently, he assumed commander of the 1st Marine Logistics Group. It's my pleasure to introduce Marine General Colin Az. Well, it's a hard act to follow. Hey, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. 
And first and foremost, I would like to thank you for inviting me to speak today. For today is a sacred day that we honor those Americans who we lost on 11 September 2001. For many have sacrificed to protect this nation. Today we honor the memories and reflect upon the lives of nearly 3,000 men and women who were murdered that tragic day. We also acknowledge all the family members and friends who still grieve their loss. We're here to commemorate the selfless, the brave deeds of the first responders, who instead of running from the chaos, ran toward it. Firefighters, policemen, service members, rescue workers, ordinary citizens in a desire to help paid the ultimate sacrifice, both at the Pentagon and at New York. We also honor the brave passengers of United Flight 93, who stepped up and took action to subdue the hijackers. And as a result, they saved lives. We'll always remember the famous phrase, let's roll. The atrocities of that day remain ingrained in our minds and written in our history as tragic and foreboding as the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. More than two million service members have gone to war since 9-11 in support of Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan and Operation Iraqi Freedom. Many who were only a few years out of high school or just children on that tragic day. But folks, let me tell you, these are truly high caliber sons and daughters that America has raised. Born in the same fiber, grit, and fighting spirit of previous generations. Instilled with the selfless sacrificing spirit and patriotism passed on to them President John F. Kennedy said, a nation reveals itself not only by the men it produces, but also by the men it honors, the men it remembers. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the significance of gathering here today. All of us have forever been changed by 9-11, directly or indirectly. We remember that day exactly where we were. I was on staff at the Central Command in Tampa, Florida, working at the Joint Security Directorate in the Operations and Intelligence Section. Central Command is the combatant command responsible for the Middle East. We were following this new emerging threat called Al Qaeda. The USS Cole had been attacked previously in Yemen. I knew when that first plane hit the tower, we were under attack. Two months later, I was in Afghanistan looking to settle the score. September 11th, we met, witnessed the most despicable evil side of man, Islamic extremists who stop at nothing to attack our nation. They kill women and children and don't value human life. The enemy we have seen over the past 12 years has even resorted in murdering its own civilians in order to instill fear and blind obedience. America was not shattered by this event or hesitant to respond. It served to unite us as a nation for a common purpose. It was a catalyst, a reawakening of America's resolve to stand firmly against terrorism in any clime or place. Following September 11th, people from across the globe and the nation witnessed America's patriotism at its finest. Young men and women zealously sought out their local recruiting offices to join the military in response to the attacks. They wanted to right the wrong perpetrated against our nation. These men and women who volunteered to serve after 9-11 knew they were likely to be sent in harm's way. 
They knew of the hardships to come and the sacrifices to be made, and yet they did so with a fervor not seen since World War II. They ran to the sound of the guns, answering their nation's call. Many questioned why young men and women continued to answer their call to arms, knowing the grave risks involved during a time of war. You know, President Ronald Reagan posed the question to the veterans at the 40th anniversary of D-Day, asking, you risked everything here. Why? Why did you do it? What compelled you to put aside the instinct for self-preservation and risk your lives to take these cliffs? What inspired all the men of the armies that met here? The response Reagan received was resoundingly and simply, it was faith, it was belief, it was loyalty, it was love. Today, we can ask the same question of our men and women who have served and continue to serve. Why? You know, Marines join the Corps for, for love of country, but they fight for each other. We fight against terrorists who attack not only our nation, but the very values we represent, life, liberty, and a pursuit of happiness. When President George Bush addressed the nation following the attacks, he proclaimed proudly, terrorist acts can shake the foundation of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. These acts shatter steel, but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. After 30 years in the Marine Corps and having served around the world, I believe truer words cannot be spoken. The unbreakable character, the dedication of our people is unmatched. United we stand. We stand for principles of a free nation, loyalty to our country, and staying true to our faith in God. Semper Fidelis, or always faithful, is not just a Marine Corps motto but rather the very foundation of our ethos of honor, courage, and commitment. And it distinguishes a brotherhood of service unrivaled by any other. Your Marine Corps will continue to bring the fight to our enemies so we can preserve the freedom that this nation cherishes. Your Marine Corps will be ready when the nation is least ready. As General Mattis said, we'll continue to demonstrate to the world there's no better friend and no worst enemy than a United States Marine. Today, we remember all those who have sacrificed on a battlefield or at the hands of the terrorists on September 11th. It would be remiss of me not to recognize our unsung heroes at home as well, our families. Without their love and understanding and relentless support, we could not do what we do. The multiple deployments our service members endured have taken a toll on our families, and we owe it to them to honor them and their sacrifices as well. You know, my son enlisted in the Marine Corps and served in Afghanistan, where he was wounded while conducting route clearance operations, searching for improvised explosive devices. He's typical of so many of our young Marines hailing from across this great nation. He just wanted to stay in the fight. Our nation has prevailed through this tragedy 12 years ago. From the ashes of that horrific day came a more united and patriotic nation. Remember the bravery of our first responders, our service members, and continue to thank them for their service and devotion. Thank a firefighter, thank an EMT, Thank a veteran, thank a medic, thank a police officer, because they are the tenacious patriots fighting the fight every day to ensure this country remains free, protected and ready to respond to a crisis when needed at home or abroad. So today, as we go forward, we will honor the innocent Americans whose lives were lost on September 11th and whose memories we draw upon as a source of strength to continue to fight. We also honor more than 5,000 service members who have given their lives in the defense of this freedom since 9-11. And more than 51,000 have been wounded since then. Thank you again for allowing me the privilege to participate in this solemn ceremony. 
At events like this, we pay homage and remind ourselves of the great sacrifices made in securing our freedom. God bless the United States of America and Semper Fidelis.
Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Short, longtime music choral director from Orange High School. Thank you, Mike. His choir today consists of these youngsters uh, from the concert choir at Orange High School. These kids were probably four, five, six when 9-11 happened, so youngsters, listen closely. You're getting a good lesson in American history. And also, the Orange uh, Master Chorale is with them today. So thank you all for that and for what's to come in a minute. Another classroom happens here frequently because our next speaker is Bruce Hershenson, who I keep inviting here. I think he's going to change his phone number, uh, because, but he keeps accepting. We love to have him because he's insightful, he's educational, he's inspirational, and he knows history, and he's been to 90 countries around the world, so he kind of has a feel for what's going on. And he was selected as one of the 10 most outstanding uh, federal employees when he worked in the USIA and as special deputy assistant to President Nixon. You may know him as a former Senate candidate, as a uh, frequent uh, commentator both in print uh, and on television, uh, an author of several books. I have to say they're for sale in our shop. Um, <laughs> Now he won't speak to me because I said that. You make a commercial message out of it. Um, but uh, not only all of that, but he's a longtime close friend of the Nixon family, of me and the Nixon Foundation, ladies and gentlemen, Bruce Hershenson. Thanks very, very much. This is a great privilege for me every time that I'm here. Uh, I love this place. And these are sacred grounds because they house the birthplace and the resting place of President Nixon and the resting place of Mrs. Nixon. Of all of the hallways, corridors, pathways in this area, I prefer right here because I believe I know. President Nixon is still breathing here, and that's why I like it as much as I do. I could not add anything more important to what was said about 9-11 itself than what the general said. It was beautifully and powerfully, powerfully said. The only thing that I'd add in listening to him is that this is current. 9-11 is current. It isn't history. It's now. And the only time we can call it history is when we win the war against radical Islamist terrorists. <laughs> As for the great comments that uh, the general made regarding the firefighters, the police, the uh, passengers uh, on the plane that smashed into the hill in Somerset County, Pennsylvania. I just say this, when I was a little kid, and maybe you had the same experience, when I learned the national anthem, frankly, it was just a lot of words. It was, uh, I learned it by rote. I didn't know what I was saying, but it seemed to be the thing to do, and so I learned it. On 9-11, when I saw those firefighters, police, running into the towers and then learned about the Pentagon, not running out of the towers, but running into the towers, now, for the first time, I really knew what it meant when that national anthem said, Home of the Brave. That is Home of the Brave. And then... <laughs> And then learning, then learning about those people, those passengers on that flight. Boy, 
is that home of the brave. And uh, those are the first thoughts I think of when I think of 9-11, because frankly, it's pretty tough, as you indicated, to think of the other thoughts of 9-11. Of, of this is also the uh, anniversary, first anniversary, of the murder of Ambassador Chris Stevens, his public affairs officer, Sean Smith, and of the two Navy SEALs who were in the annex rather than the consulate in Benghazi and tried to rescue the ambassador and Sean Smith. And I'm talking about Glenn Doherty and Tyrone Woods. And they were murdered. One year has passed. We know as much today about that day a year ago than we learned that day. We know nothing more. I just told you all we know. Four guys, four men, four magnificent men that, are, that have been murdered. It isn't that no one's asked, boy, have there been a lot of questions, but no one's answered. There have been some answers that have been proven to be totally inaccurate. There was one answer, five words. What difference does that make? I would hope that we get those answers very soon. And I got to tell you that I really dislike being critical of our government, whether it's our party, or my party, or the other party. I dislike it a lot. But I want, to I, I want us to win the war. And the only way to win the war is to tell the truth about everything, about everything other than security. I want to add that. Because right now, some of the people who have been getting the most the most difficult beating are those in our intelligence agencies, and we're going to ruin ourselves if we continue that. But in terms of being critical, President Nixon said, whatever you do, never attack a former president to defend me. That's stayed with me. I have obeyed that directive through all these decades. But thank God he didn't say anything about forthcoming presidents, <laughs> because that has allowed me to be free. I'm home free. It has been said so frequently from the administration that we have ended the war in Iraq and we're ending the war in Afghanistan. No, that isn't true. Wars can only be won or lost. They can never just be ended. There might be intermissions in a war, but they're not over until one side wins and the other side loses. What we have done is retreat from Iraq, and we are re retreating from Afghanistan. When one side does that, the other side wins. It's always, it's always true. Winston Churchill said, wars cannot be won by evacuations. And boy, is that ever true. As far as Iraq is concerned, you're not going to hear this much on, on, uh, with, within most of the media. But this past year has been the bloodiest year in Iraq since 2008. Over 5,000 people killed, and it's only September. There's Al-Qaeda now, as well as a new friendship with Iran, and Al-Qaeda even has training camps within, within Iraq. Let me go to uh, Afghanistan. Thanks to President Bush, George W. Bush, it only took 36 days, only 36 days, the end of 2001, to get the government out of the hands of the Taliban. Not bad. Didn't stop the war, but they no longer ran the country and still no longer run the country. And just as, as, just as so you know, 
The Taliban, of course, you do know, wouldn't allow any girl, any woman to be educated, couldn't go to school. And outside the Ministry of Justice is a big stadium. And late every Friday night in the stadium, which would be packed with viewers, carts of women would come into that stadium and be ex torturously executed. That was a ritual. All of that's done. And since that time, those, naturally, those exhibitions of, uh, don't go on anymore. And girls and women can be educated. But what we're doing right now is we are going to negotiate with the Taliban. And the idea, the objective, as I hear from state, from, from, uh, from the State Department, is to have a political solution. Because we're leaving. We're leaving at the end of, by two, 24, the end of 2014. To have a political solution. This political solution means that they have some person or people within the government. Man. That means that it'll just be an intermission, and they'll be back. And the stadium will be reopened, and Al-Qaeda will be hosted again. Now let me go to, uh, to uh, Egypt. I believe that we have done, every step of the way, the wrong thing. President Mubarak was in danger of being unseated. And we said, we, I'm saying collectively, not you, not me, but we said, it's time for him to leave. No, it wasn't. It was time for him to stay. Here's a guy who was our friend for 30, three decades, maintained the peace of the Middle East, which is a pretty tough thing to maintain in that part of the world, but he did. A terrific friend during the Cold War, through with the Soviet Union, shaking hands with the United States. And the gratitude he gets is he's got to leave. Worse than that, when he goes to prison and you see him in a cage, we say nothing officially. Good Lord. Of course we should say what, what, what. look, the, uh, and then Morsi comes in. And we act as though this is just fine. And then when Morsi leaves, Mor Morsi of the M Muslim Brotherhood, and then when he leaves, we start talking about stopping aid to the military. Crazy. This is a time to expand aid to the military, not to stop it. Let me go to, uh, good Lord, let me go to Syria. Uh, let me not go to Syria, uh, but uh, and I sure won't go through a timeline on that one, or I'd be here all day and night and day and night just talking about, about last week. But the latest fr is, of course, that, uh, that uh, al-Assad and Putin may get together, and I've already discussed this apparently, and have the UN uh, have uh, uh, have oversight of the chemical war, uh, warfare weapons that they have, WM, WMDs. Of the three, al-Assad, Putin, and the UN, I don't know which one is the least trustworthy, but it's a close contest. <laughs> and I don't, I don't see any future in it. I want to say one thing that you might disagree with, and, but I, I want to say it for what it's worth because it, it concerns me. I realize that right now, overwhelmingly, people are opposed to the Congress voting yes on what the President is asking. I think he should get that. He has the authority anyway. And if Congress says no, they've established a precedent, and he obeys it. They've and he's got to obey it. If he, I mean, if he doesn't obey it, it would be so terrible for him personally. But if he obeys it, he's setting a precedent for future presidents. 
If we just think of that kind of a decision between the president and the Congress as affecting this president, uh -uh. it's going to affect the presidency. And he has the authority. He does have the authority. He is commander in chief. We should never, ever, ever think of giving that authority to 535 commanders in chief. So I am for him having that if he wants to take it. He is the president of the United States. One other word, just because I have the podium and it's something that's been on my mind for a good long time. We have a strain of isolationists in the Republican Party. We've already had them in the Democrat Party. Now it's going to be the Republican Party. And that is tremendously worrisome because so many good people have said, yeah, 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 and applauded what they said. No. I heard one senator, it was Rand Paul, one senator saying, James Clapper lied, and Edward Snowden told the truth. Well, yes, James Clapper is the director of national intelligence. What do you think people in the intelligence agencies do? They lie. They have to. They have an oath not to talk, not to give national security away. Of course he lied. I assume that. I give him great credit for doing that, because we all know that must be done. He took an oath to never reveal national security. Certainly not tell it in front of a televised committee hearing. Good Lord. No, I applaud the guy for lying. For Snowden, I despise the guy for telling the truth. And what he has done is unforgivable. He took an oath too because he's in intelligence. And being in intelligence, he should have obeyed the same oath that James Clapper observed, not at all. He took all of the information he could steal and that he could put on a hard disk and told friends and enemies alike. And I hear some members of the Congress saying that this man is a whistleblower. No, he isn't. He's a traitor. At any rate, I'm giving personal thoughts and I'm taking advantage of a great audience. But I want to, I, more than anything else, I want this war won. And when I say won, I mean victory, just the way that people talked, and I remember it well, in World War II. And by God, we got it. And for those people who are war weary and who think this is our longest war because that's what we're continually told, good Lord, can't we count? We've been in Vietnam, we were in Vietnam 17 years, and, seven, and Vietnam was a theater of a larger war the Cold War, that lasted 47 years. Since when is Afghanistan the longest war? But everyone says it. Not a chance, not even close. And when we talk about the money that we're spending on, on, uh, on, on fighting radical Islamist jihadists, in World War II, the last fiscal year of that war, the US federal budget was apportioned this way. Out of every dollar in the budget, 89 and a half cents went to the war effort. 10 and a half cents went to everything else. And boy, if I can be a judge, I was a kid, but I, I know my folks and I know my teachers. I never heard one complaint. And we won. That's all that I hope for the, that's the most that I hope for the future.
Thank you, Michael Short and Chuck J. Uh, you won't see that on MTV. <laughs> One of the traditions of such ceremonies is the ringing of the final alarm. And to do that today is firefighter and paramedic for 30 years, a uh, member of the Orange County Fire Authority, Bruce Brown. Bruce? Striking the four fives is a custom of rendering final honors that has its origins in the New York City Fire Department, where many years ago, long before the advent of radios or pagers, fire alarms and daily announcements were dispatched from central headquarters to outlying firehouses by a system of bell commands and telegraph. Each different alarm or announcement would have its own number and series of bell strikes. When a firefighter died in the line of duty or some important official died, headquarters would transmit five bell strikes repeated in a series of four with a slight pause between each series followed by the announcement. This was done as long ago as 1865 in the New York City Fire Department to inform the rank and file of the death of Abraham Lincoln. The custom has continued down to present day, and this form of rendering final honors to departed comrades is known in the fire service as striking the four fives. God bless my fallen brothers.
available to play at your next party in your home, the Orange County Fire Authority Pipes and Drums Corps. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank uh, General Colonese and, uh, and his wife Mary for coming and, for, and to Bruce Hershenson for great remarks, inspirational kids. I hope you took notes. Go home tonight and at the, your parents' dinner table, tell them what you learned about, Amer about American history today. Um, thank you to Sergeant Bram for, Bramon for, for coming and delivering that pledge and for your great duty on 9-11 at the, at the uh, Pentagon. To our great uh, Villa Park High School uh, uh, Ensemble and Chuck Jay, their leader. <laughs> to Mike Short and the Master Chorale and the Orange High School uh, Concert Choir, thank you for coming. Pastor Kramen and the Orange County Fire Authority, thanks to all of you. We'll do this again next year. Please come back. God bless all of you, and God bless America.